Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We're working through a few technical difficulties, and so um, we're, we're just going to start our program uh, with me today, and I am uh, Shauna Morimoto, and I am part of the uh, advanced team, the UA Engage advanced team, and we're very excited to have you with us uh, to tell you a little bit about this grant and the opportunities that we have in store for you um, and in celebration of this great uh, momentous occasion where we are beginning uh, launching our advanced program. So we're just going to start today by telling you a little bit, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the advanced project and what we have planned over the next several years. And, um, uh, and then we will have an opportunity to hear from our, our chancellor and, um, and our keynote speaker, Dr. Jocelyn Elders. So if you'll indulge me for just a few minutes while I tell you, uh, I, I give you the advertising portion of this, um, of this event today and tell you a little bit about our grant. And I'm gonna share my screen with you um, to, to show you uh, about what we're, what we're doing. Let's see. Um, and, and a little bit about, about us. Uh, so for those of you who don't know and aren't familiar with, uh, with uh, NSF Advance, uh, NSF Advance is an interdisciplinary program uh, sponsored by the National Science Foundation. And they provide grants over uh, multiple years to institutions of higher education. And the goals for these grants are to increase the representation uh, of women in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics fields, uh, and in academia. And the long-term overall goal is to create a more diverse science and engineering workforce. Uh, but one of the reasons that ADVANCE is, has a slightly different approach than other programs to increase uh, women and underrepresented people in STEM fields is because these granting opportunities are through institutions of higher education and organizations that deal with uh, professionals in STEM fields. So the goal for these grants is to change the policies, the culture, the climate, the structure of the institution, and to create an environment that is conducive to the advancement of women and underrepresented people in STEM fields. And so with this in mind, um, we got together a team of, of folks here on campus to, to write a proposal and um, propose a, an advanced project to the National Science Foundation. Um, and so here we all are, um, and you can see us hopefully on your screen at some point uh, during our uh, session today. Um, but this is the group of people that has, has helped bring advance to our campus. Um, and uh, we're all very, very thrilled that, um, that we, got the funding and that we are able to engage and in, 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 in pursue this endeavor of, um, of, of changing what we see as meeting challenges uh, at the University of Arkansas to help um, support women in, in STEM fields and across campus. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of a snapshot. This is, um, there are lots of stuff on this. Uh, on this slide, but the main point is to think about why it is that we need um, this kind of grant at the university uh, and the institution. And um, just, you know, you can tell just by looking at these figures. Um, and again, this is just an overview snapshot that women are underrepresented on our faculty at all, at all levels. Um, and so this is, these are data from 2018. Um, they haven't changed significantly. And in fact, uh, we've been pretty stagnant <clears throat> on uh, women representation on campus for a number of years. Um, and so just to give you a few highlights, 31.3% uh, of our tenure and tenure track faculty uh, are women. 
Um, and so um, as you go up the ranks from associate to full professor, for example, 30, 37.5% women um, at the rank of associate professor, uh, that, that number goes down to, that percentage goes down to just, uh, just under 23% of, of our faculty um, uh, are, are women who are full professors. Uh, and this is, these disparities are particularly noticeable in STEM fields. Um, uh, women comprise only 20.7% of our STEM faculty. Um, so, so we can see, you know, there is a big disparity in, uh, in women's representation. But as I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, um, the, the disparity itself, the solution itself are not about particular women, but we feel like it's about changing the environment at the institution to help uh, support the women who are here and attract women to our campus. And so we have designed a number of programs in order to assist us in doing that. Um, and some of these you may have heard about or perhaps you're hopefully participating in. Um, one of the things that we have learned from women on campus is that they tend to feel uh, isolated and they're, they tend to be, um, see like, they tend to feel like they are alone um, and they uh, are not able to contribute at the level that they wish. And so one of the things that we have done is establish different types of mentoring programs to connect women to each other and other faculty on campus. And so these programs like the bridge program, which is for new faculty when they're entering um, and peer, the peer mentor circles, which uh, Kathy Sloan and uh, faculty affairs are facilitating uh, can help connect women faculty to other faculty on campus and connect faculty with one another and help provide supports that uh, some people are able to come up come by naturally, but other people, uh, sort of organically, um, but other people feel like they, the structure of a program will assist them in making these connections. Um, and so these things are underway right now, um, and we do have some additional things planned for the coming years of our advanced grant. Uh, we have a leadership training program, um, and this is to provide opportunities to prepare women on campus for leadership positions. Um, we're also working to implement a workload distribution, um, redistribution plan and dashboard. And here, what we find is that especially women and faculty who are underrepresented tend to carry a much bigger service burden than, uh, than other faculty. And this um, takes away from their time to focus on research and other professional endeavors. And so uh, we are planning to try to establish mechanisms to fairly and equitably distribute service loads and other loads across faculty. Uh, we're also pursuing best practices in hiring and recruitment to attract diverse faculty and women to our campus. Um, and all of this together is part of uh, the program that we have planned. Um, but my main point and the, the main thing that I want to emphasize is not about what we're doing or what we found and, and the data that we've looked at, but it's more about the project itself, which is that it's really a project for all of you um, and for all of you who are here with us today and able to join us because we know that um, the women on campus uh, face challenges. Uh, those, we know that those challenges are unique to women on campus based on a host of, uh, of things about their social location uh, and who they are and where they are. That, and, and we recognize um, that they are that they're serious and that they um, affect your work and your ability to work. But we also know that um, in facing these challenges, you also have talent and drive and expertise. Uh, and we know that by supporting you and hearing from you, um, we, can, we can tap into that 
in a way that will uh, make your job more fulfilling, uh, make the university run better and more smoothly, and really um, tap into the key to expanding our knowledge and to creating scientific breakthroughs uh, and for teaching and supporting our next generation through our students. So we know that in supporting you, um, the university will reach the next level of excellence, but it's that it part of that is to support you. So we urge you to be part of our programs, to join us, um, but also let us know what's going on with you and, and what are the supports and, and things that you need and require um, to make you better able to be your, your best self and fulfill your career um, and research goals and objectives. So that's just a, a short kind of overview of what we have planned over the coming years and why we're very excited about um, our advanced grant. Um, and I would like to welcome now Dr. Charles Robinson, our chancellor, who is also a co-PI on this grant, um, to, uh, to, have, uh, to offer a few remarks to us um, about this opportunity and the wonderful things that we have in store. Uh, for those of you who were, who were at his talk yesterday, he spoke about, uh, about belonging, and that's a lot of the theme of what we have going on with uh, our NSF Advanced Grant uh, UA Engage. So thanks again for joining us, and I will now um, turn it over to Dr. Robinson. Thank you, Shauna. Um, I want to I am not Kathy Sloan, but I am at Kathy Sloan's computer because my computer doesn't work. And I'm honored to be at this computer and carry the name Kathy Sloan. So Shauna, I've had an opportunity to listen to your remarks and they were wonderful about UA Engage. And I'm just here to echo and endorse the importance of this to our campus community. Uh, for all the reasons that Shauna laid out, it is a critical component to our effort to enhance belonging, to enhance uh, diversity and inclusion on our campus. And uh, I'm excited to be part of it. And I want to encourage others to uh, support the endeavors uh, meaningfully as, as well. I think the campus community is, is moving in the right direction with uh, this type of program and others. And, and, and I want make sure that we do everything we can to, uh, to achieve the goals, not just to have the, the grant, but to achieve the goals of the grant. Uh, just not, you know, we don't wanna just look like we are interested in diversity. We want to demonstrate that meaningfully through outcomes that reflect it. And there's no reason why we can't be successful here. Uh, no reason at all. Uh, we have every motivation. This is not only the right thing to do, it's good for the University of Arkansas in every way. I, I keep in mind, I was talking to Kathy, who is to my right, by the way, she's off screen, but she'll be back in her place uh, very soon. But I keep in mind that 55% of the students on our campus are female. And what does it say when we have, you know, that percentage of female students, but we're underrepresented, in the faculty that engage them. That's not a good message. We, we need to do better. And I have every hope and uh, belief that we will do better. And this grant will be a big part of it. So thank you, Shauna, for your leadership. And thanks to all. And Dr. Elder, it's always good seeing you. I've had the pleasure of meeting you. May, you probably don't remember me, and that's perfectly fine. But I've had the, proper, pre, the pleasure of meeting you and I'm very honored to, to see you being a part of this program. And, and on behalf of the University of Arkansas, I want to offer a welcome to you as well. So thanks everybody. I'm gonna let Kathy get back in this spot and uh, try to get my computer fixed so I can listen in to the program uh, moving forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chancellor Robinson. Um, wonderful to have you here and um, Thank you for joining us and supporting our, uh, our goals through UA Engage. Uh, I now want to have the, uh, I have the distinct pleasure and uh, overwhelming opportunity to introduce 
uh, Dr. Jocelyn Elders uh, to, as our keynote speaker who is with us today. Um, so I, I, I can't think of a better person to help us uh, kick off this, this initiative. Um, Dr. Elders, for those of you who don't know, is uh, was the 15th Surgeon General of the United States. Um, she served the US from 1993 to the beginning of 1995 in that role. She is a professor emeritus of pediatrics and a distinguished professor of public health at UAMS. She, Dr. Elders is a native of Shaw, Arkansas, where she, uh, at a, the age of 15, won a scholarship to Philander Smith College, uh, where she earned a bachelor's in science. Um, and then at 18 years old, she entered the US Army. Uh, and this allowed her to attend medical school upon completion of her service uh, at UAMS through, um, through the GI Bill. Um, so she earned her MD from UAMS and subsequently earned an MS in biochemistry from, um, from UAMS. Uh, she is an expert in pediatric endocrinology and the author of hundreds of articles and publications, as well as the winner of numerous awards. And I don't want to go into listing all of those awards because I know that what we all want to do is hear from Dr. Elders. Um, so Dr. Elders, thank you very much for joining us. And um, I want to welcome you and ask if you would be willing to share with us a little bit about your own story, um, since we are talking about um, you know, women in in STEM fields and women who are um, dealing with issues of how you balance uh, being a woman in, in, in a field where you are underrepresented uh, and um, any thoughts that you have and stories you would like to share. We're very excited to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shana. It's really such a pleasure for me to, to be here today, to be with this exciting group of young women academians and for me to be around all these bright young students who are coming to join and who are participating in STEM fields and to know that you have 55% of the people on your campus as women. That's a real pleasure for me to know that. And, and I know in a significant number of them are in STEM field. It's also a real pleasure for me to see Dr. Robinson, the, the two of you leading this program. And I know your plan to make a difference. I want to tell you that the university has come a very long way. They have a long ways to go, but they've still come a very long way. I can remember when, back when, let's say when I entered medical school, even while there were three people, three women, and there were three blacks. So I, so, and I want you to know that we could, they didn't even allow us, the black medical students could not even eat in the main dining room. We had to eat in the dining room with the yeah, yeah, with the maids and the or nurses aides or the people of color. I know that doesn't seem like much, but we've come a very long way. Someone was asking me about that, and and my response was, you know, I didn't come to medical school to eat with white people. I came to medical school to get a good medical education. And I feel that I got that. And, and, and they worked. Well, this was changed after less than a year. But I'm just saying that you, when you think back, and, and you know, that wasn't a hundred years ago because I'm not quite a hundred yet. So, but we've, we've come a long way in making a real difference. My time in medical school was to say that medical school was not hard for me, I don't know of a doctor who ever got out of medical school who didn't say that it was not difficult, that we did not have to study hard, work hard. There were an awful lot of material to learn, but you wanted to learn as much 
at all you could because you wanted to be able to go out and take good care of those people in your communities that really made a difference. We, were, we all weren't training to be neurosurgeons or space engineers, but we were training to, we all wanted to make sure we were good physicians, whatever field of, that we went into. And to me, that was uh, really very, very important and very critical. One of the things that you had to have, and I think that, that, that we had to have is, and you have to have, and you're going to have to have, as you begun to move out and leave this crowd that you're going, going out to lead because you are going to be the leaders of, the next, of this next generation is one of the most important things that you've got to have is vision. You've got to be able to visualize much farther than you can see and find out and see what's going on and know what it is you want to do, how you're going to do it, how you're going to get there and think of all the people that's going to help, have to help you to get there because you can't make it by yourself. And I know that probably better than anybody. Being from a poor rural community, population of 99, 98 when I went to Little Rock to, to attend Philander Smith College, not even knowing that I had to apply to school. Luckily, I was sitting in the hall crying after I got there and the president of Philander Smith College just happened to be walking through the hall and wanted to know what was the matter. But I started trying to tell him what was the matter and I was bawling so much. He just said, he said, go on down to the dormitory. We'll talk tomorrow. But, but you, you see, I had just left my hometown. My sisters and brothers had picked cotton to get bus fare all day for me to get have bus fare to, to come to Little Rock. And so when I, and, and my young brother, who was five years old at the time, he was out helping. And he looked up and he wanted to know, he says, do we have enough yet? He wanted to know, did we have enough for my bus fare to go to Little Rock? And I want you to know that at that day, I promised myself, if I ever got out of the cotton patch, that I would make sure that any of my sisters and brothers, whoever wanted to leave, could get out. And I want you to know, and, it, and, and I'm bragging for a minute, and this is off the subject, but I want you to know, first of all, I had eight sisters and brothers, and I was number one. I was mother hen to, to all eight of those. And I want you to know that five of those finished college. And I have a brother who's a veterinarian, a sister who was on the faculty at Howard University, another brother who was over, was a, a minister and he, he was over, over minority health and guidance for the Un, United Methodist Church for the world. So, so you can see, I, I, do, I, I do like to brag a little. And my other brother who was probably he would have what we call, uh, he was, he, he didn't, he didn't read well. He was, he didn't do well in school. And I, it, but he worked for General Motors for 53 years and missed three days of work. You know, you can't have a better worker than that. And so I'm saying one of the things that my mother taught us is to be good students, be good people. And she always taught us, never, if you want, she always taught us, if you want to get out of the cotton patch, you got to get something in your head. And so we spent all of our lives working to get out of the cotton patch. And I had my niece laughing this morning. We was talking, she was talking about my cleaning my house. And I told her, I said, well, I said, you have to know, I said, one of the things I used to tell the world that I was the best maid I know. One of the things that uh, the teachers 
taught us at our high school before we graduated from high school is that uh, she wanted to make sure that we all learn to be good maids. And I want you to know that we knew that. And I thought, we thought, I thought that to get out of the cotton patch and to go and work for Dillard's department store would be heaven, like a miracle. Well, I got out of the cotton patch. I was able to do a little more than work for Dillard's department store. Not that that's anything not good about because I love Dillard's, but I'm just saying that we, that was all we could aspire to be. And people often ask me, Dr. Dillard's, did you ever always want to be, they'd say surgeon general or doctor. I say, I never saw a doctor until I entered Orlando Smith College. You have to know, you can't be what you can't see. You see, we didn't have television. We didn't have electricity. We didn't have running. They couldn't have te te uh, te uh, te uh, te television. We didn't have running water, you know, indoor plumbing, you know, things like that was just, we didn't even know about it. So how could we think of having them when we didn't even know they existed and, and that they were out there and available to have? So I'm just saying these were some of the things that was really going on in my world when I left to go to Philander Smith College. Well, a Dr. Edith Irby Jones, who was the very first black student, she happened, excuse me, she happened to be a woman to attend the University of Arkansas School of Medicine. She came, we invited her to our chapel program. She came to our chapel program and she gave a talk. She talked about the different roads that we, we could take. She talked about the difference between the high roads and the low roads. And she says, in the between, on the misty paths, the rest walk to and fro. But I want you to know, after hearing that Dr. Jones speak that morning, when I was a sophomore in college, all I could ever think of was being as a doctor. I wanted to be just like Dr. Jones. She was a Dr. Edith Irby then, but she was a Jones later on. And she actually, she just died about two years ago. So I'm just, so, I, and so she was my guiding light on the hill where I was always trying to, trying to be like, the, like Dr. Jones and trying to make a difference. And I think we have to all have to do that. So, but I had, a, had kept, you have, to, you have to capture a vision and make sure we keep the eye on the prize. Don't worry about all who you have to get to help you. Whoever it is, many people have to help you and you don't ever worry about who gets the credit because it doesn't matter who gets the credit. The thing I've learned is that we get the job done. And I've, and I've learned that over and over and over so many times during my time in college, my time in medical school, my time in the army. I went to the army to use the GI Bill to go uh, trained as a physical therapist to be able to use the GI Bill to go to medical school. And I've worked with the most one, 18 of the most wonderful young women. And I think we did a wonderful job of making a difference to soldiers after the Vietnam War, war and treating them. And I, but I knew where I was in the, in the Army. I was in, went to the Army to use the GI Bill to go to medical school. That's a being able to always keep my eye on the prize. After, while I was in the army, I had to take a, few, a course in physics and another course. And one of the best courses I ever took was a course, if you can believe it, in public speaking at the University of Denver. 
And I was taught by a Jesuit priest. And he always talked, bounce it off the wall, bounce it off the wall. And that helped me more than anything else. Because when I became the Surgeon General, that was what I was doing, was running around, running my mouth all the time. But he had taught me how to talk and, and some of the things. So, so it was really very important. And I think, you know, you never know who's really making a difference and moving you up the pathway to where, to where you need to go. go. But after get, being in the army for three years, getting out, going to medical school at the University of Arkansas, I again met 100 of the most delightful, wonderful young men all up there, all Southern, all from Arkansas. They all had their Southern quills. They all felt that women, their job for women was to be barefoot pregnant and in the kitchen, that you had no business being in medical school. In fact, I even had a man on the, on the eleva elevator to tell me one day, he said, ma'am, because you got in medical school, they didn't let my son in, you know. So, but, but you know, but that I didn't, that was not my problem. That was his son's, his problem and his son's problem. So, and I think that we have to look at things like that and I always know and think about what it is we need. What's our vision? What it is we need to, where it is we need to go, how are we going to get there and who do we need to help us get there and make sure that we always keep our eye on the prize as we, as we move along. So after I finished my finished medical school, and I was so thrilled, you know, I'm saying, well, nobody in my family ever finished college. Well, then here I am finishing medical school. Well, you know, I would, then I start doing research and I was fortunate enough to get a wonderful mentor. And we did a lot of research on using chickens very grateful for the chicken factory or whatever because they gave us loads and loads of chicken eggs. And so my dad, they asked my dad, he said, well, what does your doc, daughter do? He said, well, she said she was a doctor. I thought she was a doctor. But all I know is that the, she, uh, she grows, grows and raised chickens and talk about killing chickens and chicken eggs. Well, we was, we, we was looking for a specific growth factor, some out of neediness of sulfation factor. And so I'm saying that you, you do a lot of things on the way. And you know, there were a lot of young women who really helped me and pushed, pushed me along the way. But the person, the mentor who pushed me the most, you know, when I was finishing my residency, I said, it, he said, Dr. Ed Hughes, he said, what are you gonna do? I said, oh, I'm gonna go out and practice. And you know, you know that would have been wonderful. But we'll, it, he said, no, you, he said, he said, you know, we don't have any black faculty on this medical school faculty. He said, we need some. He said, and besides, you would be a much better re researcher. He said, but you don't have enough sense. And you, when you go come up and be a fellow, he said, you're gonna have to go back to school. That's how I ended up getting a, a, a a degree in biochemistry because that was at the time when we was isolating hormones and doing a lot of identifying a lot of the factors that was going around. So I really spent a lot of time learning to be a pretty good biochemist. I got a, a I got my degree in biochemistry. I almost, if I if I could have written better, I probably would have gotten a PhD. But since I couldn't write too well, but but then I've learned that I had to write to write papers. So, but, but I think that that's all a part of academic education. It, see, I would have never been able to go into academics without the extra training. I would have never been able to go into academics without an, a mentor standing around, pushing me, making, making me do the things that I needed to do to prepare myself to be a good, a back teacher, number one, and the secondly, to be a good mentor. So because of that, because of research, 
because of the other things I did and probably because of my speaking, I gave a talk once in old, in, not old, in Atlantic City. And, you know, and my mentors had drilled me so until if you touched me, I'd probably stop reciting it out. And, but he said, it was the best delivered, best speech I heard while I was there. He was, on, they were trying to recruit him from Harvard to come to Arkansas. And so they said, well, why are you going to look at, look at Arkansas? He said, the reason I'm going to look at Arkansas is because of that. But again, it was my mentor that prepared me. So yeah, I'm, I made an impression for the university, but I'm saying you, have, you never know when you're out there being, having to make an impression. Well, as this went on, well, of course, then I worked hard and, and I was asked to be the director of health for the state of Arkansas. Well, you know, I was a, more of a scientist. I wasn't a public health person. I didn't know, I didn't know anything about public health, but uh, President, then Governor Bill Clinton asked me to be. And so, well, then I was kind of encouraged to, and so I, I, he, he asked me if I would do it. And well, I thought, well, you know, here I'm, a, in a research lab, I that young scientist working with me. Why would I go to be a health director? And uh, I, he, I said, well, uh, I said if you, I said if I said if you let me run the health department, and I keep my tenured professorship at the university. And, and, the, and then I get an increase in pay. Well, I got everything but the increase in pay. But uh, be that as it may, the most enjoyable six years of my career, working career, a little, a little more than six years, was as director of the Arkansas Department of Health. I, I really loved it. M wonderful people, but the most important part of it. I would travel all over this state, went into every community and feel that I really made a difference for people. I, fe I felt so good about what I was doing and about what, what was happening. And the people at the health department felt so great and they did such a good job. And whatever community they needed, I said, you go out there and you find out what they need. And, and I said, and I said, we'll have to worry about getting it. And so, 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 so that was probably one of the reasons why it was just so wonderful. And I had so many wonderful people committed. And that's one of the things I have to say, if you love your job, you know, you don't, you do it, you enjoy every minute of it, it whatever it is, always make sure you try and choose something you enjoy, choose something you like. And as far as being a woman, well, I had to suffer whatever I didn't worry about being a woman. You know, I was said th things too that I didn't want to hear. And I, but I felt that if, if I always worked hard, knew where my place was and knew where their place was, I had no problem because I, I could handle all of that and I could make a difference. And I felt that I made a difference for awful, awful lot of young women. And then as I traveled around, saw all the problems that we're having with teenage sexuality, teenage pregnancy, poverty, ignorance, all the things that was going on, I couldn't sleep at night. I just had to be up worrying, so I start complaining. And of course, I, I complained so much, I felt that all I knew to talk about was the sex. Well, I said, if Arkansas had the highest teenage pregnancy rate in the industrialized world, and we are losing all these bright young women, we've got to do something about it. We can and we will. And so, so I, I start running around and luckily, you know, even the TV stations start helping me and the people in, in the 
ministers start helping me. And I, and I told, I said, you know, I said, we just can't afford to keep losing our bright young people. So I was out complaining an awful lot it, 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 as a woman trying to make a difference. But what I tried to do is make sure I learned the facts, got the facts before I went, went out. But then when I got them, I went out and started talking about them. And I told everybody I could see. And I'll never forget my deputy director, Mr. Tom Butler. He says, we've got a health director now that's raised on always walks on the edge, edge. And we have to make sure she's always raised it show. And you know, when you have 2,600 people like that standing behind you, pushing you up, trying to make a difference, it's, it's easy. It's fun. You get up at five o'clock in the morning wanting to go to work, want to stay until eight o'clock at night and want to go out. So I'm just saying it's, it's really fun. So when I was asked to be Surgeon General, that was pretty, I didn't necessarily want to be the Surgeon General. I already had the best job in the world as far as I, as far as I was concerned. But I want you to know, I loved being your Surgeon General. I was taught, taught in the middle of a pit my president, nor many have really understood what the problems were going on. You know, we were in the middle of the AIDS epidemic. We had a teenage pregnancy epi epidemic. We had an STD epidemic. And, you know, I, this was just a real problem for me. And I never forget, I met the uh, maker of, trunk, of, of Trojans. And he bought, we met for dinner on a rainy night in Chicago. He says, doctor, uh, doctor, I hear they call you the condom queen. I want to be the condom queen, a king. And so I was on, that tro his, on the Trojan board and helped to make major decisions regarding Trojans. And I understand the company grew faster than ever. I just made an important suggestion I don't know whether they're going to take it or not, but but I think it should. should. I told them about how Kotex taught me everything I knew about men, menstruation from a little packet that they put in their box. But these are from so so all over. Women and men have really been making an awful lot of difference in my life, and so I think the it's really important to have mentors. It's them important to make sure that we have people ca who can push us up. And we've got to be, if you will, advocates. Advocates for our community, advocates for our young, but advocates for our students. We wanna make sure that when our students leave us, every one of them, if they have a vision in their eye, they can extend further than they can see. A voice in their ear, they can hear you long after they're gone. In fact, sometimes they'll, some of my students will come, Dr. Elder, you told me this, a song in their hearts and a scroll in their hand, which is a good education. And I'm sure that's what you're doing and that's what you're about. So if we're gonna be advocates and we're going to make this world a better place. The first thing we've got to do is we've got to know that we're all involved. It's not some of us. It's not over here. It's not over there. It's all of us. So we may not sleep in our beds, eat in our tables, but all of the young people out there belong to us. And they really make a difference. We've got to have what I call dedicated, we've got to have dedicated pushers. We can't, we, we have to be dedicated to make a real difference. We've got to have a voice in our ear, a vision in our eye, and we've got to be able to communicate to all of those young STEM people who are out there needing a push. We'll have to take every opportunity we get. 
to make a difference. My brother, who is the minister, he says, opportunities are like a single strand of hair on a bald head man. It only goes around once. You have to grab it and it's there. So when it's facing you and that strand of hair is facing, as a teacher in STEM, whatever it takes, stimulate it and get it moving. That's what you use and that's what we have to know that we have to take. We've got to be aware of the problems, become advocates for the problem. We've got to develop an action plan to get it done. We've got to use every week, every week, everybody we get, every once one of our faculty say, if you've got a student, you can't get anything across to them, send them to somebody else and see if they can make a difference and see if they can get them involved and working to make a difference. We've got to use the three T's of commitment. We've got to use our time, our talent, and yes, the, my, my preacher always tells me, we have to dig down in our pocketbooks sometimes and even give up our treasures. We've got to educate and empower our young people so they can make a difference. They can create a better world. We've got to transform our health care system. We've got to transform it from a sick care system to a health care system. And that's what our young people are all about. And that's what we've got to do if we're going to be su su successful. And if all we have to know what it is, what we mean when we're talking to be, you look back and know what we mean when we've been successful. So as I think about it and know that you are out there trying to make bright, successful, young STEM people who are going to make a difference, who are going to change the world into a far better place. And we've got to change it to a better place. We can't, can't stay where it is. You see, if COVID has not taught us anything else, it's taught us that the population of our country is changing. It's taught us that the nature of disease is changing. All we have to do is look at what's happening with COVID. We know that disparities are persistent. We've, tried, we've been talking about equity and equality and things ever since I've been out there and even longer. And it's been one of the major aims of our healthcare system. We all believe and know that healthcare should, should be a right, but we know it's not because there are lots of people who really don't have that right. We've got the best one, sick care system in the world, but we don't have a healthcare system. So I want you to train bright young people who can go out and transform our sick care system into a health care system so that all people will have a right. And as we do this, I think we must, we absolutely must focus on prevention. And I think it's up to faculty like you to train our young people. They aren't born leaders. You have to train them to be leaders. And the five C's of leadership. And so I was giving this years ago, I never forgot. So Dr. Eldridge, you've got to have, but for the first C, you've got to have a clarity of vision. You have to know what it is you want. You have to know how to, where you want to go. You got to know how to get there. But you've got to be consistent. You can't go this way today, go that way tomorrow. You've got to be consistent. You've got to be competent in regards to what you want to do. You've got to be competent to get it done. And I think that that's what you're doing, is training bright young people how to be competent. We've got, and we, last but not least, and they've got to be consistent, last but not least. And they've got to be committed 
You aren't going to get there unless you're committed. Last but not least, they've got to have control. So now that I'm gotten to be a little old lady and I don't know anything to tell bright young people like yourselves, but I was told that years ago, there's an old Greek, Greek saying, it says that as we get old, we sit on, we, we plant shade, shade trees under whose shade we know we'll never sit. Not to know is bad. Not to want to know is worse. Not to hope is unthinkable. But we don't care. That's absolutely unthinkable. I know you're all there because you care. You're working hard to make a difference for the bright young people. It's going to take good care of me now that I'm 88. Thank you. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure to hear from you. Uh, we re really enjoyed your remarks. Um, amazing. So I wanted to just take, uh, we have a few brief minutes. So I wanted to see if there was anybody who had um, a question for, for Dr. Elder. And if you have questions, you can type them into the Q&A on your Zoom screen. Um, so I'll just ask a I'll, I'll ask a brief question um, about um, you. You mentioned at the end of your talk a little bit about about the COVID crisis, and and one of the things that we've also noticed is that COVID had a way of you know revealing all of the disparities that exist um, and just exacerbating them. So no matter where you were, people that were faced with challenges um, were just made more extreme. So if they were um, challenges about their, their job or challenges about their health or um, challenges with childcare and, and things of that nature. So um, I was just wondering if you have any thoughts about um, possible you know, solutions that are coming from, from how we're reckoning with the COVID crisis or different ways of, of looking at these questions about um, healthcare and equity or, or things of that nature? You know, I think we're at least uh, beginning to look at the, the COVID crisis has made us really look at equity. It's made us look at childcare. You know, we never even, and when we think of women and childcare, who do you think it is that's, re, is, responsible if when when somebody gets sick it's the women in our society we we're the nurturers we're the people who take everybody to the doctor including our husband so that that's a real important issue and i think for our society to be really looking at child care what can we do about child care how can we prove child care and to really start with early childhood education, to really be and to do comprehensive health education is really going to make all of us healthier. And I, I really think that those are some important issues that are really being considered and that we need to all think about and we need to all be involved and try and make a difference. Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, excellent advice, and and also something that's so important to us too. You know, as we're thinking about uh, UA Engage and this NSF uh, grant, and and a lot of the things that we talk about and come across are, you know, issues about childcare and how that uh, has an impact on on women and in, you know, in women who are working uh, in at the university. Um, so I have another question um, uh, from Karen Siebold, uh, who is in our audience, and she wanted to know uh, if you find the politics around sexual reproduction rights to be more polarizing now than you when you were first um, starting this fight around sex, sex education in the early 90s. Uh, and I know that this, um, she, she mentions that she grew up in Arkansas. 
Arkansas, so she remembers uh, hearing about you pushing about this, and I know that this was uh, a major uh, topic for you while you were also Surgeon General. So, do you have any comments there? I, I'm, I'm. It saddens me that in 2021, that we're st still talking and acting at this level. You know what we really needed to have done. We should have educated all of our children and our parents. You know, we need, I've said, and I told Bill Clinton before he even ran for president the very first, we need to make sure we had early childhood education. Well, they're really talking about doing that now for all children. The children who need it the most are the poor children. Children who are, are half as tall as they'll ever be by the time they're three. They know half as much as they'll ever know by the time they're four. Hope, will, and drive has been determined by the time they're five. So I feel that we've got to get up and get busy and push for all children to be able to have early childhood education, comprehensive health education. We wouldn't be running around worrying and arguing about uh, immunizations. Uh, you know, we are. We, you know, we talk about what well, we don't. What, what we fight about immunizations. Children, I know they couldn't go to school before they were immunized because if they got an excuse for not having an immunization, it had to be reviewed by the health department and I had to sign it before it went out. So we, so we know that no, nobody, nobody, nobody wants to get sick. We want all, we, we want all of our children to be protected. For all of our families to be protected. We want them to be well. And you know, we have and we have to do what we have to do. We have to wear masking, and we have to do social distancing, we have to get our immunizations, whatever it is we have to do. And so I'm very pleased that they're dropping the immunization age down to five. And you know, before that, they were already getting immunized, immunized for mumps, measles, chicken pox, you know. As a pediatrician, that was those were the things we had to do, and you had to have your immunization record before you could even start school. But when we talk about sexuality, you know, we all act as if, you know, that that's non-existent. But and but we are sexual beings from the day we're born until the day we die. We put all of that emphasis, and we've done all of this fighting. About uh, about abortion, I'm not about abortions. Nobody is about abortions. No one, no woman I've ever known wanted to get or have to have an abortion. But we are buying, we want to have healthy, educated, motivated children, and so yeah, and. I, I, you know, I was beat on a lot, you know, in Arkansas about accusing people of having, many people of having a love affair with the fetus. And the reason why I said that is because they loved little children or little babies as long as they were in somebody else's uterus, but they did not want to provide health care. They did not want to provide welfare. They did not want to provide food stamps. They did not provide... It helped schooling, early childhood education. They did not want to take care of the children once they were here. And so I feel that until we move into that mode, we need to get over our love affair with the people. Thank you. I, I, I think as a follow-up to that, um, and to what you're, you're saying, um, Dr. Jeanine Perry had a question and she wanted to know why you think, uh, if you have thoughts about why things like childcare and pay inequalities, uh, structural pay inequality, family leave, and, and these kinds of um, initiatives, why, why do they seem still so invisible and, and not part of the public debate? Uh, when, when will we be ready for action on these things and why why does it seem to be taking so long? Well, we don't, I, well, you know, I still think men have not gotten, you know, it's really uh, the men fighting. As we get more women 
as as being uh, politicians, more women in nurturing positions, more women in you know taking care and, and decision making positions. I think a lot of these kinds of things will go away. Yeah, you know, if when the baby gets sick, if somebody has to not go to work, it's the women. They feel somehow they've not accepted that women's work is important. But I want you to, it, and it's a controlling issue. And we as women have got to stand up and fight for our rights. We've had to fight for a very long time. We're still fighting. We've still got a long way to go. But let me tell you, I know we've come a very long way. Well, that, that is like our mantra, I think, <laughs> for this program and for, for what, uh, what we all believe. So um, I, I just, I wanna, one last question and then we'll, then we'll let you get on with your day. Um, we just wanted to know um, uh, how you balance um, fighting for what you believe in with kind of stepping on people's toes or, or you know, understanding the machinations of, um, of leadership and, and, and power and those kinds of things. You know, I think I probably was never polished enough to know not to walk, to know not to step on toes. The important thing for me is I wanted to do the good thing, the right thing. It, as I saw it, you know, that doesn't say I was always right because if you were wrong, I didn't mind going back and say, you know, I was wrong about that. And I think we have to be willing to do that. But I felt that if you know, you know, make sure that what you're fighting for is the right thing. Make sure it's what you truly believe in. And if you, when you no longer believe it, admit you don't believe it and say that. But to really try and always do the right thing, do the right thing by everybody. Try and make sure that children and, and all of, all people are getting the right, uh, the right uh, th thing done by them, and, and and to me, that to me is 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 what it's all about. That's what that's what a healthy having healthy people in healthy communities are all about, and have and making sure that we're all out there fighting to make sure that it comes about, and. And, and, you know, and one of the things that, again, a, men, a mentor told me, he said, Joyce, never give up your power for somebody else. He says, make sure you fight for the right things, make sure you believe in the right things and try and get the right things done for all of the people. That that's what it's about. He said, when you go home at night, you sleep good, even though you hurt a few feelings, that they'll get over it when they realize that it was the right thing. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, very inspiring words, and and I don't know if you can see um, see in the chat, but we have a number of people who are just uh, overwhelmed and very grateful for for your having you here and, and very inspired by, by your words and, and uh, learning about your history. Um, so we appreciate you joining us today very much. It's a real pleasure for inviting me in. Maybe, maybe before the three years is up, you'll invite me back if I'm not too old. Then. We would love to have you. We would absolutely love to have you. It's Thank been you. an absolute pleasure. Um, so, Thanks. Uh, thank you to thank our you. audience. Thank well. all of the young people for coming in and listening to me. And thank you for all you do and all you're doing and all you've got to do. I want you to know there are lots of problems still out there in the world. We left lots for you to do, and I expect you to get them down. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. We we have three years, so you know. <laughs> uh, get so it all done. Good but get as much as you can. <laughs>
And that's actually a great, a great segue because we are um, a few members of our team are going to take some questions too from the audience and talk a little bit about uh, what we have planned for U of A and, and get some feedback from you about what you would like to see and, and what you feel are, um, are our big challenges or other things that, uh, that we can help address. So uh, I believe um, we have a panel and I think that Dr. Ramsey is going to help us out here. Um, Thank you, Shauna. Yes, I'm right here. Um, hi, everybody. I am the project manager of the um, UA Engage team and the NSF Advance grant. Um, and it was amazing to just hear Dr. Elder speak. Um, and I think it's very inspiring for all of us to work even harder to make the changes that, um, you know, especially hearing from what kind of changes uh, have, you know, occurred since, since you know, she was in school. Um, and uh, to hear more about kind of what we have planned and kind of where we're going, we would love to, um, we're going to have a little panel. Uh, we would love to have audience questions. So if you have any questions, uh, please go ahead and put them in the chat and then I will pose them to the panel. Uh, but first, I would love to have our panelists uh, introduce themselves and kind of explain what it is about this project and UI Engage that excites them and got them involved. Um, so why don't we start off with um, Dr. Needy? Thank you, Lenny. Hi, I'm Kim Needy. I'm the Dean of the College of Engineering. And to borrow a phrase from Dr. Elders, you can't be what you can't see. As an engineering student, as a practicing engineer, as a engineering faculty member, and now as an administrator, I've worked in an area mostly with men, very few women in my community. And so what really inspires me about this NSF advance grant that we have is the importance to recruit, retain, mentor, and develop women faculty in the STEM fields and to develop them into leaders. Because if we have women present in engineering as an example and other STEM fields, it will allow us to attract both undergraduate and graduate students in larger numbers and build a better climate and really not because it's the right thing to do, it is the thing to do to improve, uh, to improve higher education and then to improve the field. Thanks. Thank you, Kim. Um, next, uh, Kathy. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. And thank you, Dr. Elders. I feel so inspired it, on this stormy day. I just feel like my spirits were lifted by hearing about your story and your great words of wisdom. So I'm Kathy Sloan. I'm the Vice Provost for Faculty Affairs and also a professor of Latin American history. Now I had the fortune to actually join this team when it was already very far along. Um, I replaced Rhoda Brezzo when, you know, after she retired or, or left the position of Faculty Affairs. And so, yes, I did participate in some of the writing, but it was already in process and I was so happy to join these women that I've respected and admired for a very long time. I do feel like the initiatives in the in the UA Engage grant really mesh well with faculty affairs and faculty development in general for all faculty. I think a lot of the programs that we, we are undertaking like the service dashboards, the peer mentoring circles, the bridge program, they're they ensure faculty success for everyone. But I'm very interested in promoting um, women in leadership, faculty of color in leadership, but also their development. Um, because as a historian, uh, my focus was on women and in particular working class women and trying to kind of uncover their voices in the archives. You know, these are people that didn't leave records that were so noticed by historians in the past. And so promoting women and gender um, has been a lifelong um, passion of mine, and I'm so happy to be working with this team. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Um, Anya, would you like to introduce yourself next? 
Okay. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you everyone for being here uh, this afternoon, morning and afternoon with us. My name is Anja Zajicek, and I use pronouns she and her. I am a professor of sociology and an associate dean in the College of Arts and Sciences. My participation in the U of A and SF advance efforts actually dates back to 2007 and is grounded in my lifelong commitment to equity and social justice, especially at the intersection of gender and race and ethnicity. What really excites me about this particular grant is that it provides a great opportunity to make our university truly attractive to diverse faculty, especially women of color and white women in STEM, while really extending the benefits of institutional transformation to all faculty and our institution as a whole, including our students, which is something that uh, uh, everyone else uh, mentioned, who will have enhanced access to the faculty with whom they could they can identify. And uh, Dr. Elders, just like you stated, it is important to do the right thing for everyone. And that's my mantra. Thank you. Thank you, Anya. Um, Yvette, would you like to introduce yourself to us? Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us. And Dr. Elders, a tremendous thanks to you learned so much, was inspired. You know, the tag points for our U of A Engage are empower, lead, and transform, and your life has truly been a model for that. And it was great uh, to hear uh, your experience and how you still are uh, leading and transforming and empowering. So thank you very much. The, the, I'm so excited by the UA Engage grant because it is all about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And as we strive as a campus, to create a place where everyone is positioned to thrive um, in all kinds of ways. I, I think the U of A Engage grant really is doing a, a, will do a wonderful job of targeting in on not just programming, but policy changes and strategies and institutional level change that will have a lasting transformative impact. So really thinking about how do we transform the culture and the climate uh, in terms of one that's going to position everyone to thrive. So really excited about the opportunities that are there, um, particularly having those opportunities target women of color and uh, white women. And so really thinking about the intersections of race and gender um, and all that, that that will do for everyone on our campus, right? If, if we have some major transformation and inroads in that area, our campus and even beyond our campus, our state as a whole will thrive. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, finally, Shauna, I know you've already um, talked a little bit, but I would still love to hear from you a little bit more about what excites you about all of this. Thank you, thank you, um, thank you, Lenny. And I, I want to reiterate again my my thanks to Dr. Elders and and for the for this group, this team, uh, this wonderful team of um, of people that we man managed to put together uh, for this grant. Um, so again, my, I'm Shauna Morimoto, and I have been working on this project um, for quite a while, uh, and and just am so excited to finally be able to to bring uh, advanced and institutional transformation to the university. And my my th the things that excite me about it are my commitment to to diversity and inclusion, my interest in finding ways to create a more equitable and a more uh, inviting work environment for everybody, for all faculty across campus. Um, my feeling that it is about social justice and it is the right thing to do. And all of these things are so important. Um, the acknowledgement that we have to have, um, as Dr. Elders reminded us and, and Kim noted, uh, you have to uh, see it to be able to be it, right? We have to have mentors and, um, and representatives of all kinds um, who can pave, help us pave the path for the next generation of, uh, of educated students uh, who will become our faculty and our innovators um, in the future. But the biggest reason um, for me is that I feel strongly that you can't 
actually expand knowledge um, unless there is diversity in it. And so everybody has something to bring to the expansion of knowledge. And that is our mission as an institution. We want to provide new knowledge and educate people with new ideas and information. And so if we continue to have the same people um, with the same experiences, educate and look for new types of knowledge, then we'll continue to come up with the same ideas. And so we have to broaden the basis of, of our knowledge um, to keep striving for excellence and keep uh, achieving new new heights. Um, and so that is my uh, very um, lofty, but it, uh, I don't think understated wish for this grant and, and the thing that really excites me about it. Thank you, Shana. All right, so um, we would like to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, I have a question I'm going to start off with, but please feel free to use the, uh, the Q&A uh, chat to ask any questions that I can pose to the panel. Um, what I want to start off with is a little bit about our current situation, because the past year and a half or so, uh, COVID-19 uh, has emphasized many inequities, I think um, highlighted and emphasized them. What opportunities do you see for universities um, in relation to these inequities, especially the ones kind of affecting women and underrepresented minorities? Anyone want to start us off? Anya. OK, I can go. So uh, first of all, I want to kind of briefly build on what uh, Shauna just mentioned and uh, the whole idea that excellence is inclusive, not exclusive. And then uh, I want to talk about a little bit about the pandemic. And, uh, you know, I believe uh, that the pandemic brought front and center the experiences and challenges related to the underrepresented STEM faculty have been experiencing, including isolation, lack of connection to highly productive senior faculty and faculty teams, or the need to clarify written and unwritten rules of academic success. So in these and many other ways, the pandemic has certainly amplified structural inequalities related to gender, race, and ethnicity. So I hope that kind of moving forward with this project and the university as a whole, we recognize that our traumatic oftentimes experiences with and lessons from COVID are also an opportunity to reimagine the academy and especially our institutional practices, policies that Dr. Murphy Erby talked about and our support systems. So I believe that in this context, the implementation of the bridge program that I work uh, uh, on implementing with uh, a wonderful team of women uh, will across our campus will ensure that all underrepresented faculty feel welcome and have equitable access to quality mentoring that is intentionally geared toward their success. And I was so pleased to hear Dr. Elders say again and again and again, mentor and mentoring. So thank you so much. Great answer, Anya, thank you. Um, another question that we have for you is, um, what do you guys as a team, um, you, the UA Engage team, what do you guys need from the campus community? What are you hoping for from the campus community in order to kind of meet the, the goals of the grant? Hi, this is, this is Yvette. One of the things I, I think that the campus is doing and, can, and can, is already doing and we always can continue to do more of is just to be engaged. You know, that is the name, U of A, U of A Engage. And so really figuring out what role you can play and leaning into that role, really uh, doing what you can do to make a difference for that student or for that colleague or for that faculty member um, or even for our campus as a whole or outreach to our communities um, 
our, our region, our state. And so really asking yourself, asking yourself the hard question of how can I make a difference in terms of creating a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive culture and climate? What's the thing that I can do? How can I contribute um, to making a difference in that regard? I think that's one thing. And I also think um, one of the things I heard from Dr. Elvis is that this really is about um, driving innovation, driving excellence, and driving equity. So innovation, excellence, and equity um, are, are really the outcomes, I guess, the grander things that we're really after. And so um, in my mind, I think that way we get there is by being more inclusive, um, by having enhanced diversity, um, because that means we're bringing a lot of different mixes into the conversation. And so all that we can do to champion diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I know that's a little biased coming from the Vice Chancellor for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, but I do think that that's a key factor uh, in the grander scheme. Thank you. That's a great answer. Uh, go ahead, Kathy. So I would, I would add, you know, thinking about people that I communicate with, maybe not quite on a monthly basis, basis, but very often are our excellent department chairs and heads from all the different colleges. And the chairs and heads, I see some of you are on here. I see that Lynn's been posting in the, in the Q&A and the chat and such, but really you are gonna be on the front line of helping us achieve a lot of our objectives, especially with the service dashboard and making sure that service uh, assignments are equitable across you know, ranks and gender and ethnicity, et cetera. And I know you all are on board. We've had some preliminary discussions about this and I'm so excited because we, the uni university has some really, really great department heads and chairs and Shauna Morimoto is one of them, by the way. <laughs> Thanks. I'll just I'll take an opportunity now to, to echo <laughs> Kathy's comments. Um, no, um, uh, but but I just uh, to Kathy's point too. I think you know it's a really a matter of, um, of of people, and I I mentioned this too in my opening remarks. People just being involved in in the projects and 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 letting us hear from you too, um, and not just in terms of leadership helping us implement, which is going to be great and we will be um, we will be looking for that assistance but you know let us know what's going on and what are the things that you are seeing and what are the um, what are the barriers that that you are facing as as faculty and a lot of this is because we know that you know women have challenges but we also know that those challenges are very different depending on your physical ability or your race or um, your sexuality or uh, your caregiving status, you know, who, who in your household you have to um, be a caretaker for and what support you have there and, and a host of other things that, that make these challenges um, particular and, and things that some of us, you know, we have a, a lot of different experiences on our team, but they certainly don't cover everything. And so, so we need to know what those things are from you and, and how the institution can better support and, and serve you. Thank you, Shana. Uh, Anya, did you have something to add? Yes, I wanted to say that uh, we'll need the support of both women and men. We need both women and men to uh, kind of come together and support us. But at the same time, I want to say that we are here really to support the faculty and the department chairs, and we'll serve with expertise, resources, and uh, our own effort to make sure that whatever we ask you to do with us, we also contribute in many ways to make sure that we facilitate everything that you do and everything that we ask you to do. So we are not just not asking you to work for us, we are here to work with you and for you to make everything a just a little bit better. Thank you. Thank you, Anya. So um, I think we're kind of at our time. So uh, at the end of the session, um, I would love to thank everybody for showing up. Uh, this was really great. I would love to thank the panel um, for being here and kind of, um, you know, telling us more about the project and introducing yourself. 
Um, I would obviously like to thank Dr. Elders again um, for her amazing talk. And um, I would also like to advertise that we have a website, uaengage.uark.edu. So feel free to take a look there. Um, it, we will expand upon it uh, with all of our projects. The, the bridge program and peer circles is on there, uh, but our future projects as we are enrolling them will be on there as well. Uh, through the website, you can sign up for a listserv if you want to stay updated on what we're doing. Um, and feel free to email us um, through the website and, and contact us uh, if you have any suggestions, thoughts, or questions, um, because we're really, as, uh, as was said multiple times, we're really here to work with you all um, to work towards our goals. So again, thank you. Um, and Shauna, I don't know if you have any final words. I just want to thank everybody. Um, thanks, thanks to the wonderful team. Thanks to uh, Lenny and Jeanette and Diana for their support and all the behind the scenes work that um, that we didn't see going on. And um, and special thanks, of course, uh, to to Dr. Elders for being here today um, and sharing her story with us. Um, thank you to the chancellor and. Um, uh, Everybody else have a great day uh, and we will be in touch.